Hey, welcome to Muley Monday. If you're obsessed with chasing mule deer, join us every Monday morning as we dive into all kinds of mule deer hunting. From high mountain backcountry to the desert flats and everyone from the pros to average DIY guys. We're going to share some amazing hunting stories, tactics, conservation issues, and even tips on gear for your next adventure. This is the Rich Outdoors Muley Monday. Today's episode brought to you by Onyx Maps. Onyx is a must-have tool for all of you serious hunters. With season just around the corner, I am constantly using my Onyx to e-scout and learn everything I can about my upcoming hunts. Onyx Maps works across all of my devices so I can scout areas, mark locations on my desktop, and then automatically they appear on my phone when I'm in the field using my smartphone as a GPS. Onyx even works on your phone if you don't have service or it's in airplane mode. I just save all the maps that I am going to need. And before I head into the the backcountry or go out of service and my Onyx app will show me right where I am and show me all of my waypoints from e-scouting and all of my marked locations. Onyx is available in all 50 states, and I can't speak highly enough about this system. It is truly a must-have for me, and I think anyone hunting out west. Even if you're not worried about the public-private, you're hunting deep in the wilderness, it's still an awesome tool, but if you're anywhere near private land, it is a must-have. Use the promo code TRO, and you'll get 20% off your membership Go download it today and get familiar with the app before your hunt. Don't download it on your way to your hunt. Get familiar with this because there's so many cool tools that you can learn from it. Go to onxmaps.com. Check it out. Today's podcast brought to you by Solo Targets. Solo targets are life-size, ultra-realistic 2D targets, and I have been obsessed with the solo targets and love the realism of having to pick a spot on an animal and not just shoot a dot on a block. The solo targets you can turn, with the solo targets, you can turn any block into a ultra-realistic hunting scenario for much, much cheaper than a 3D target, and preferably, I think I prefer them over shooting a 3D target. I also really like that all the targets are actually life size, which really gives you a feel for what an animal is going to look like in your sights at different yardages. I just got the new mule deer buck target and the thing is badass. The target alone will give you buck fever. It's a giant buck. We set it up in the field and with just a small block target behind it, which is so it adds that realistic pressure of having to hit the vitals because if you hit anywhere else, you're not going to hit the block that's behind it. Uh, it is so fun. Just that added little bit of pressure makes you really hone in on that target and it adds to that little buck fever scenario, puts the pressure on, so to speak. Head over to solotargets.com, check them out. Awesome. They got elk targets, they got antelope targets, mule deer targets, all kinds of cool stuff, sheep, bear, all kinds of great targets. Use the Rich Outdoors promo code TRO and you'll get 20% off your new badass target system. All right, Tyler, welcome to the podcast, buddy. What's going on? Not much, man. How about you? Uh, not a whole lot. I got so many scouting trips planned and I'm trying to like knock out podcasts. I got so much going on right now. So wedding is out of the way. Now it's like full blown scout mode. How about you? Uh, not that, I mean, I'm pretty much full blown scout mode, but just moving back from Arizona, uh, had me a little bit tied up with scouting season this year. So we we're just, just barely getting to hit it hard. So nice. Well, Tyler, you're a freaking long time listener, huge part of the podcast, been, I don't know, in the indoor or not indoor in the, uh, insider group for a long time. So I'm like pumped to have one of my, I don't know, old school, I can't say old school, like long time listeners on the podcast, going to BS about mule deer. You've been getting after it super hard, and uh, I kind of want to go at it and just kind of see where it goes, but ask a lot of questions, a lot of for the new guys and people just wanting to get hella serious about killing a mule deer. Awesome. That's, I mean, that sounds, sounds about where I'm at in life right now. I I just, I just got to get the killing part down. (laughs) So give us a little background and kind of where you're at and uh, some of your story. So I guess kind of start where where I started hunting was just with my uh, family when I was young. 
uh, going with them before I was able to rifle hunt. Um, I'd kind of just show up like on weekends when I didn't have to go to school and stuff. Um, I've only been able to harvest uh, mule deer uh, twice in my life. Uh, just a couple of two points with a rifle when I was about 14 and 15, so the first two years. Um, and then my family uh, just kind of took a took a little bit of time off, and it wasn't really a priority for me with playing sports and uh, you know between that and pr- pretending like I was good looking chasing girls. Uh, <laughs> it was- wasn't that big of a priority or didn't see a, a benefit to it at all. Um, I left uh, after high school to go on a mission, uh, came back and kind of didn't know what I wanted to do with like work and everything else because I didn't didn't have a college or anything set up. Um, so I just kind of did more just like labor, you know, hard labor jobs and stuff, just like construction, uh, like HVAC and uh, framing and stuff like that. And uh, one of my buddies, my one of my best friends now, Mitch Libby, uh, he works for a long range gun building company now, but he um, has always been in, uh, into archery. Um, and he invited me one day to come over to his house and kind of, kind of basically, I mean, he's basically the one that converted me to archery because Like I said, I didn't know what I wanted to do professionally, but I also didn't, you know, really have many hobbies since high school sports was over and you can't really do much if if you're not in college. Um, So with that, I started shooting. Um, I picked up archery in the middle of the winter. Um, So it was a lot of, you know, just indoor stuff that we were doing at the time. Um, But I, I mean, instantly knew that, you know, that was going to be something that I, I wanted to pursue the rest of my life, whether it was just for a hobby. Um, but as of today, um, it's, you know, it's it's my one of my professions now, uh, trying to be, be a part of the outdoor industry, um, not like a face or anything, but be able to be a part of helping other people get into it just because I've known, the, you know, how hard the learning curve is um, or could be. Um, and I've just tried to give everybody as much knowledge as I can that, you know, that I've, I've gone through and trials and stuff that I've gone through to be able to, to get to the point of hunting, I guess you could say a hunting career, my very, very small hunting career that I've had. So no, I think there's a lot of guys in, in your shoes and that's why it's kind of cool to do a podcast on it. Just, I mean, like I said, you've been listening to the podcast for a long time, been supporting the podcast. So like there's a lot of guys in your same shoes that maybe they hunted a little bit as a kid, but it was never like a serious thing. And there's definitely a, a gap. And I think it's, you know, a lot of people can go hunting with their parents or, and just never really get into it. But yet when you take that leap and you kind of take that leap that you did and, and getting super serious about it and archery has that effect anyway, because you just have to take things more seriously and it, 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 it takes training and it takes practice. It's not like you just go out on the weekend and, you know, shoot one with your rifle. So it takes a lot of preparation. I think that's what a lot of guys get into it. So it sucks you in. It's like just how much work goes into it. And it's a full-time hobby. I mean, like you, you know, scouting and, and shooting your bow and prepping and gear and research and all these things. It's a, it is a full-time hobby. And I think that's what sucks a lot of guys in. And I think there's a lot of people in your position where, yeah, you may have hunted before, but like the learning curve can be so hard and there's just so much information that a lot of guys like myself take for granted and and you don't think about. And so I I do know that sometimes I, you know, don't ask the simple questions because it doesn't come up. And, and so it's kind of fun to talk. It's going to be fun to talk to you and kind of get, you know, where your original hiccups were, what your problems were, like what you still struggle with, all those things. Cause I'm sure that there, like I said, there's plenty of people that are in the same boat. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, but working, uh, kind of, you know, in the place that I work currently, I run into that, you know, day in and day out with, uh, you know, people calling in and stuff. Um, I guess if you wanted to kind of just get into kind of what I do now. Yeah. Um, I mean, you're but, working for Camo Fire. Everyone knows Camo Fire. Awesome freaking company. Uh, Kendall's a great dude that, I mean, deals everyone. Yeah. We, we love Camo Fire. So, so how did you go? You were in construction when you, you know, applied or got the job with Camo Fire. Did you know that at that point that you wanted to be in the hunting industry? Oh, absolutely. It was it was a little bit, but I mean, I would say probably about six, <laughs> seven months ago that I had, you know, started to look look for opportunities to work really in any um, position in the outdoor industry, um, whether it was even just something as simple as like Sportsman's Warehouse um, or like an archery shop that I worked in um, in Arizona for quite a while. 
Um, I mean, a little while, but just like any any way that I could find, you know, get some time in or be able to to get paid to be able to, you know, talk to people about hunting, um, learn from people about hunting, be able to share my like we're you know already talked about just a little bit of knowledge with the learning curve about hunting, like anything I could do um, to do that. It was just it just drove me more and more to find like a career path versus like something like Sportsman's Warehouse or something like that, or, you know, other, other like big name brand companies that aren't like, you know, very, very specific. It's just a, like a one size fits all kind of place. Um, unlike like Black Ovis or something like that, where it's, you know, could be very specific to, you know, backcountry hunting or hiking or anything like that. Um, it's just hard to, um, be able to make a career out of something like that when, you know, you can top out it so far, but I needed something that I could be able to, you know, turn into a career, um, where I could make enough money, um, to keep, you know, my, you know, to keep the bills paid basically. Um, but also be able to get time to go out in the field because ultimately that's, that's what I'd like, you know, like to do is just be out there and be testing products, using products, um, being able to come back and talk to, you know, customers, my coworkers, my, my, my boss about, you know, things that I've used, um, and be able to give that, feedback back to other people uh because you know as a quote-unquote i guess gear guide is what they call it at uh kind of what my position is or a couple other my coworkers' positions are um people call in multiple times a day you know asking you know what's your opinion on these boots versus these boots or you know this water bladder versus this one like it's it's you you've got to know i mean if you don't know um it's I mean, I don't BS stuff and I know nobody, you know, that, that my coworkers BS stuff just because, you know, that could be someone's life that you're messing with in a, in a way, um, yeah. you know, because I mean, gear is very important. Um, so when, when it comes to that, you don't want to, you don't want to, you know, short people or, you know, lie to people about that. So the more stuff and like experiences and people that I can talk to about this product, the better I can help people be outfitted in a way, um, to where they're comfortable um, you know, they, they want to continue hunting, you know, throughout the rest of their lives. Um, because a lot of people call in and ask about just basic stuff. Like, you know, what are, why are like, why do you like this boot or this backpack versus this backpack? And it's just people getting into it because as we know, a lot of people already have like that are already set in their ways with, uh, you know, the outdoor hunting industry, they've already got their brands and they've already got their boots. They like, they know what's, you know, fitting them. But for me to be able to be that first you know, hand, you know, handshake in a way, I guess you could say, or introduction to some of the, you know, people to hunting. It's, it's, you know, it's an important job, I feel like, um, you know, in, in my position to be able to bring hunters, because we all know, like, you know, people are out there trying to stop hunting and, you know, discontinue hunting. And if someone has a bad experience and doesn't like hunting, and it continues to, you know, get worse and worse, or if they just, you know, ultimately don't like it, then it's, it could be, you know, it could be a non-hunter versus a, you know, hunting situation where they, I mean, as we see in the, you know, judicial stuff, it's, you know, it's very, very important that we bring as many people as possible to our side of the, you know, the perspective um, to be able to continue to hunt. Because if we don't, then we're not going to be able to do this, you know, this thing or this passion that we have, you know, every day. So. hundred well, percent. What do you think it is that, really sucked you in and made you obsessed with hunting? Um, ultimately I would, I mean, it, it was really a lot of things at once. Um, it just, honestly, it just felt like I needed to be able to do that. But I think one of the biggest things is with me playing as much sports or being as big of a sport fan, really, there's not much to do sports wise in the middle of summer, really anywhere. And with archery, I mean, I can, I can go out every weekend and find, find a deer versus like with the rifle hunt. I, you know, it could be a wasted, a lot of wasted time if I go during the summer and try and scout. Um, but I think the combination of being able to kind of prepare for the archery hunt by being in the mountains, uh, combining that with camping and even fishing on, you know, some places, wherever you're at. Um, but being able to like, 
prepare for something just like sports, like practice every single day. You prepare for one, you know, one big event on the weekend or, you know, one game, one, you know, one chance that you have. Um, I think it's just, it was just an easy conversion for me to be able to physically, you know, get out there and physically prepare myself for the, for the week or, you know, even if sometimes a couple weekends that I have to be able to, you know, to go all out and try and make, make something happen and, you know, ultimately come out in, in some terms victorious, you know? Yeah. No. Well, how was your, your first hunt? What was your expectation going into it and kind of what was your thoughts afterwards? Do you remember? Oh yeah, it was, <laughs> it was, uh, <laughs> I, I look back and I it's just, like I'm almost embarrassed to kind of, you know, even talk about it just because of like how unprepared and like I went to, I mean, I used like a Jan Sport Walmart backpack and thought I was going to be able to use just some hammock with a quilted, da- like or a quilted uh, like sleeping bag and backpack for like two or three days. I didn't even make it probably a mile and a half and I came straight back to the truck and was like, holy crap, I don't like, and I, I, I had planned through Google Earth, never even heard of uh, uh, Onyx Maps, Uh, didn't know like what to look for. I had printed off a piece of paper from Google Earth that I had like screenshot and printed off at one of my jobs. And I mean, I was just very, very underprepared and just didn't have any um, like experience but not experience like just being out there, but like talking to people. I'd, I'd never even talked to people about archery hunting. I just thought it was going to be like, oh, that deer just like is going to stay there while I walk straight up to 50 <laughs> yards. And like he's he's going to stay out in the open. I'm just going to, you know, put my bow in front of my face. And hopefully that, you know, breaks me up enough to walk straight at him. Because I had watched like some video on – uh uh, like a, I can't remember who it was. It was on the outdoor channel a few years ago of a guy, he put his bow over his head during a moose hunt Yeah, and he like waddled pretty much like back and forth like a moose. And he got right up to like 30 yards and I was like, holy crap, like that's gotta work. If he thinks that my bow is like my antlers, like he's going to want to stand there. Like, uh, please tell me you did that on a high country mule there. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah, dude. It was <laughs> Like I said, dude, I was absolute. Like now, that is absolutely embarrassing. If I was to see that happen, I'd just be like, "What in the world, man!" Like, uh, and it, yeah. So anybody thinks that works, it does not work. So <laughs> maybe for moose, moose are not super intelligent animals. <laughs> so yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I yeah. I mean, obviously, it did work, but <laughs> completely different application uh, settings that I was in. So. So, you got your butt handed to you the first hunt so to speak oh, yeah. <laughs> what what advice would you give yourself going into that hunt if you could do it all over again if you could go back in or, time like two weeks before the hunt and talk to yourself what would you tell yourself sit down uh be patient and two weeks before i'd probably say go and try and contact people that, you know, at a local bow shop that are, you know, known to be, I mean, in some senses like killers. Um, I've, I've learned probably a big, I I would, you know, consider a big, big portion of what I've learned uh, to a lot of the like local guys that come into some of the bow shops that I've been able to be in and like just talk to that you do not see on social media, you do not see, um, out and about even, um, other than the fact when they come in, they've got pictures on their phones, um, of them sitting on top of a big mule deer, the big bull or, and they, they do it consistently though. They've got, they've got years of, you know, experience in different States, different, I mean, terrain, just different things. And it's the, those kind of people that, I like to, you know, just kind of pick their brain um, if they're willing to, because a lot of them obviously they don't kill big stuff and give out all their information. But being able to sit down and just one on one be like, all right, I was in this situation. Uh, like, what would you have done? Just kind of give them like scenarios that I've been in and I've screwed up. Um, and, you know, just kind of give them like the facts and settings of like what had happened and why it messed up. And I've I've learned so much from just those those local undercover guys that you know are just killers yeah and i think it really helps when you can 
take an, a situation that you are personally in because you can sit and listen to podcasts and, and okay, here's the right thing to do. You know, here's a perfect case scenario for putting a stock on a buck. But when you have experienced it or you take an experience that you've already had and you say, oh, well, here's the situation. I came up. This is where I saw him. I tried to come from this way, blah, blah, blah. What did I do wrong? And, you know, most people can say, well, you know, I, it wasn't there, but, you know, maybe try this or do this. And that helps because it sinks in your head a little bit more when it was like something you went through, something you experienced, and you can see the two contrasting approaches to a situation. And you're like, oh, well, I walked this way and I should have went, oh, I should have went high in that situation. I should have waited till he bedded down the second time. It, things tend to stick in your brain a little bit better when you have firsthand experience, like that hands on effect, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, especially, I mean, one, when you said that, like one ins- or, uh, instance came to mind about a mule deer that I had last year. He was just a, I mean, he was a decent three by three, but he was, uh, he was, I, I was coming out of a canyon. I looked back from just where I'd come from and he had went and bedded down. And I was like, holy crap, like instantly had bedded down. As soon as I turned around and saw him, he went up under just some brush. Um, and I was like, holy crap, he's right in the middle of everything. Um, if I come from the bottom, he's going to see me and I know the thermals are coming from the top. So if I come right through the top, he's going to smell me. Um, and it was the second to last day and I was leaving because I was done, uh, with the hunt and I had to be back to work the next day. And that exact same situation came up. I was like, Oh my gosh, this, this guy had told me this, like if I come in from the side and just sit down, he should bed to me, um, because of the way that he's, he's, he came into the basin, um, and kind of the the knowledge that I gained from some of the does, because the does would do the same thing. They would come in, bed under a couple of these uh, thick brush, get up and keep moving the same direction. Um, and I came, I, so I made that stock. It was like a, an hour and a half. I had my you know shoes off, down to my socks. I had I was within I think 40 yards, and I could just see his antler tips. And it was it was just so hot. I mean, it was I think it was like 95 that day. No trees around me, just the thick brush, um, just a lot of sagebrush, and the exact same thing in my mind. I was like, "Oh, like I, I don't want to, I don't want to sit here all day. I've, I'm down to the last couple of sips of water that I have, and if I kill him, I'm gonna have to go get more." Like just a lot of like different scenarios and things that I had heard like through this podcast or through other podcasts, through similar situations. Um, and my buddy uh, Lance Harris had a similar situation happened with his big uh 200 inch plus mule deer that he killed on the wasatch front and he had but his was in the winter so he was actually freezing his butt off and i'm over here sweating my butt off and so i thought that if i would throw a rock past him to where he would hear it he would stand up and turn around and i he wouldn't see me that i would be able to shoot and in my mind i was like oh my gosh this is lining up to be exactly that like this is what this is what's going to happen he's going to stand up So I did that a couple of times. I threw a couple of rocks as far as I could, like over the top of him and past him. And instantly he stood up. But instead of staying the direction he was facing and looking where the rock was, he looked directly back at me and just stared me down. I, I, and I, I mean, I screwed it up because of that versus like, I didn't even think about, oh yeah, just sit here and wait for him to stand up and, you know, feed towards me and then I'll be able to shoot. Um, And it's, just experiences like that, that, you know, I mean, I, I couldn't have gained anywhere else, but doing that, even if I listened to the pod hours and days of podcasts, like it would not have been anything different. Yeah. The old rock trick is, (laughs) that's a tough one. And it's funny because you'll see that done in a video or something and you'll remember it like, Oh, that was clever. You know, it's, it's something that's clever. But it yep. does it, for as many times as a dude throws a rock and a buck stands up and looks away from you. Like there was ten times that someone threw a rock and that buck just bolted. You know, like especially high pressure areas. And like I think you'll see it on videos and it'll be like some big ranch where deer have really never seen humans or care. Oh. But when you talk about the Wasatch or bucks are getting chased, like they know people like any sign of anything, and they're probably just gonna bolt. Yep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he, he literally stood up, looked at me gone instantly. As soon as, <laughs> oh, and, ah, oh, man. Yeah. I know it's exactly what you're saying. It's just, just experience. 
Um, and you know, obviously I'm probably never going to do that again. Um, and I'll just, I'll just sit there and sweat to, to death if I have to, to be able to get a shot off from now on. So, and patience, like I was saying earlier, patience has got to be, you know, a virtue. Like it's, it's gotta be a number one thing, whether it be glassing or a bedded buck or anything like that, I think is a big, big, uh, issue that I've always struggled with, um, with, you know, with learning how to hunt, <laughs> And I think that comes a lot with people, new hunters, especially if you haven't had success yet, you tend to start to push things and you push things. And it's hard because there is a lot of times where pushing things will get it done. And it's knowing when to push and when not to push and when to be patient. And that's so freaking hard, especially when you're just starting out. You don't have the gut instincts of experience, of prior experience to help you. But I think so many guys, like especially you get two or three years under your belt and you're itching to kill that first buck and you start to like really pressure things, especially with mule deer, I would say more than elk. Like with elk, you usually shy on the side of actually pushing a little bit harder than you should. And mule deer, Uh side on the patient's side, so to speak, and same with antelope. By putting a sock on antelope, just always take the hard route, always take the patience, always sit in the hundred degree weather and wait it out. Like time is your friend. Patience is your friend. And like, I, that's, I think I see so many new hunters that try to force situations, especially with mule deer. You're trying to force it, trying to make it happen. You want it so freaking bad, but then you blow it. Oh yeah. Yep. And I mean, even, even within just mule deer hunting, like you're saying with the, like erring to the side of patience, I think with my little, my other little bit of experience that I've had with, um, rifle hunting, I mean, we're on four wheelers, we're hiking, we're like always moving one to keep warm because most of the time it's freezing cold, Mm -hmm. but two, we've got a rifle in our hands so we can be loud. We can be walking through basins. We can be running ridge lines and being loud, but with archery, even with me going in to check my trail cameras, every couple of steps or every few steps that I take to get into like cameras, I'm looking around because I don't want to bust, uh, you know, those deer out because the first couple of years I would do that and I would have, I would, you know, continually have a lot of pictures of, you know, does and bucks and, uh, elk and stuff on there. But as I would check it probably once a week and I slowly started to see that, I was actually pushing stuff out when I was being loud and being like coming in there is, you know, just tromping around like a hiker and having my dogs and, you know, other people with me talking loud versus like this year and last year, I decided to try like as if I was hunting into the camera. Mm -hmm. Um, I've consistently had the same number of pictures throughout the, you know, every week that I've been able to get in there versus you know coming in there every week being loud like like making it almost like you know a public place um which you know deer aren't gonna like that elk aren't gonna like that they're 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 in that spot because they are away from the roads they're away from campgrounds um they know you know they know that that's quiet and safe and that they can you know they can be alerted when you know something's there and i've actually physically noticed that with my cameras and uh you know number of pictures that i've had on my trail cameras too so no absolutely i mean it's huge and even just the number of times you check in things like that um just always being very aware of your surroundings is so important and i think it's it's hard because you don't learn that until you get a little of experience you know and it's kind of hard to teach that did you so you didn't really have any mentors or any help like when you first got into hunting again i guess um have you had a lot of people or has it just kind of been through the bow shop uh pretty much through the bow shop and then my one buddy uh that had uh you know got me started in archery Mm -hmm. uh but with him being able to get the job that he had did has at the at gunworks he's so like physically busy um and he's already got like his hunting crew and his hunting camp um and I've, I've literally hunted probably, oh, it's been over, it's been over about two and a half years completely by myself, all my scouting trips, um, except for this last hunt in Arizona that I had for my over the counter deer tag. I got invited by a buddy to, from, from the, one of the bow shops again, uh, to go with them. But I have literally did not have one person, um, come with me or go hunting with me up until, uh, about six months ago when it, during December. Um, so I was in the field by myself, 
uh, you know, for, you know, day in and day out pretty much, um, you know, other than maybe the occasional bump into someone while I'm hunting. Uh, but it's not like we, you know, buddied up or nothing and hunted the rest of the time. I mean, I had my week long backpacking trip all by myself, even, uh, in Utah last year and the year before. Uh, and it gets, I mean, it, honestly, it it gets kind of sketchy. Um, but you know, it's, uh, it's just how it is. I mean, I love it so much that like that, at that point I'm, you know, unafraid to kind of go in there by myself just because I know, I know the area, I know myself. Um, but like I said, that first year, I didn't even make it like a mile off the road. And I was like, ah, I'm going to turn around. This is a little sketchy. I better, you know, I don't want to be unsafe. And now that I've had experience, um, and I've got, you know, been able to talk to people, a lot more people about it and have hunting partners actually, you know, that want to go with me and, um, you know, get into hunting and stuff like that. I mean, I'm, I'm hunting with guys that are only one or two years into it too. So we're all sharing our, you know, very beginning knowledge of, you know, hunting and everything. So no, that's awesome. And that says a lot about your character to be able to do it and gain the confidence and work through that by yourself. I think there's a lot of guys out there that want to get into hunting, but they don't have anyone else to do it with them. And so they're not really willing to jump in it alone. One of the things I was going to ask you is like, what were some of your biggest struggles basically learning on your own with no mentor, no anything? Um, so probably the biggest thing, um, is, like, I, I think patience still again, um, just because I was never patient. I always wanted to walk right through the middle of stuff just to get to the next basin. Um, and it's, I mean, it's really tough to just for me to, I, I mean, I, I, I have a pretty bad case of ADD, so I, I not like sitting somewhere like at any point, any time, even if it's like a sporting event or, you know, church or anything like that, I got to be moving. I got my knee or like, you know, my feet are tapping or something like that. So for me to sit down in glass basins, um, when you don't, I mean, when I don't see anything for 10 minutes, I'm like, Oh man, there's nothing here. What a waste of time. Like I got to go to the next basin. There's probably something out there right now, you know, just waiting for me. But, and it, I think just calming down, taking a sip of water, <laughs> snacks or like having something to keep me there, um, you know, is, 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 was the biggest thing. Uh, but probably stalking would 100% be the hardest thing I think, or the biggest thing to learn. Um, because when it's, I mean, Utah archery, it's usually, I mean, middle of August, hottest time of the year, even in the high country, the leaves are, if, if we haven't had water, um, it's, I mean, the leaves are crunchy, whether you're in the pine trees or you're out in the open in the sage, the leaves are crunchy. So you can get 200 yards maybe. Um, but if you don't have shoes off and you're literally tiptoeing every single step that you're going to, you're going to make some type of noise. So it's, I think I, cause I had never had anybody, you know, teach me how to stalk. I, I'd heard people and seen, uh, like, you know, videos again of people taking their shoes off, but it, they would never, like, they never explained like, oh, this, the, you know, if the wind is at this direction or the, I, I didn't know anything about thermals or nothing. I, my first year, I think I busted on, I guess, or my attempted stocks as I guess you could call it, uh, probably like six or seven deer within the, the first three days of hunting. Um, and it was like embarrassing. Like, like I said, now <laughs> back on it they were like probably not even like 250 yards away and they were gone i mean the whole basin was gone so um it's i think stalking and patience are going to be the two things to focus on for you know any first time hunter or um, anybody that's about to get into it yeah do you i mean obviously it is doable because you've done it but i was going to say you know what's your thoughts on people who don't don't take that step or don't take that leap because they don't have someone to teach them or don't have a mentor or things like that. I mean, I would say you've probably learned as much as anyone, like you're well on your way to being a successful hunter. I think it's just time and confidence. And most of that has been completely on your own. So I like, it's super interesting to me because I see so many people that just don't even give it a shot or an effort because they don't (laughs) have someone else to teach them, which seems like the easy road. I mean, you've kind of learned everything on your own, just, I mean, yeah, you worked at a bow shop, which is pretty beneficial. And it's actually a really smart idea because you're just going to be yeah. talking to people about hunting all the time. Um, yeah. The bow shop's like the local watering tank, you know, it's just, that's where everyone goes. 
to be yeah. us about hunting. But I mean, essentially, you know, guys can do it on their own by podcasts, videos and things like that. Right. Oh man. It's podcasts and videos were probably the only two reasons that kept me archery hunting. Uh, because that was the only way that I, cause I'd only worked at the bow shop, um, within this last like four months. Like I didn't, I, so I would go to the bow shop to get my stuff, you know, tuned and worked on, but that would only be every like once a month. Mm -hmm. Um, and I still, I mean, I would talk to people, but once a month you're one, you're going to forget about a lot of the stuff that you talk about, um, unless you're taking notes or something, but two, I mean, you're hit or miss some of the people that, you know, some of the real killers is what I would call them, you know, that would come in. They're not usually coming in every single day. They're only coming in, once every you know summer as well um but podcasts and videos were by far my you know the two staples that kept me hunting because of the knowledge that i was able to gain um like i mean like you've had randy Ulmer, you've had uh ryan carter you've had jason carter like just guys that just know and have had that experience and are willing to give that hardcore information that they've given or they've put in work to get um because if I wouldn't, I mean, if I didn't have any of that stuff, I honestly probably would have just gone back to like rifle hunting and just, uh, just, you know, being a, a weekend type warrior for hunting, um, and just been miserable, you know, doing the jobs that I was doing. Um, but with the podcast, um, I listened to podcasts probably 12 hours a day for probably about eight months. So I, I mean, I've gone through a lot of podcasts. And like gone back into history and stuff and listened to like your podcast uh, or like Jay Scott or uh, Epic Outdoors. Um, just people that, you know, are consistent with their, you know, their content and giving, getting quality guests or quality, you know, interviews um, on their, on that podcast. Um, but I also was able to take notes, which has been a huge thing for me. Cause like with me, if I, if I'm not taking notes on something, like I said, I have ADD. If I'm not taking notes on something, I'm, I'm forgetting about it like an hour later <laughs> just with, you know, with work or anything, or, you know, even if it's like a really good, good tip that I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is the reason I didn't get, you know, get this deer or this, I, this is the reason I didn't get this done or, you know, whatever else it is. If I'm not like taking the notes and physically going back and reading through those notes, then I'm not going to remember it. So it's even if it's just a little snippet of what it was, um, it'll like just flash that memory in yeah. my ADD ridden head. So it helps, <laughs> you know, helps me remember um, all of that stuff is before I go out in the field, um, which has been a huge help. So through podcasts and like specifically, there's an there's a I think it's I can't remember what the app is called. It's like an outdoor channel app, um, but it's got like oodles and oodles of uh, like the Western Hunter and like really, really good quality uh, like productions of like being able to physically see, you know, how this stuff is applied versus like through podcasts. Like people can tell you what the terrain looks like and like how they did it and stuff. But if like for me, I've got to be a visual learner. Um, so if I'm not physically seeing like, Oh, this rock shelf is where they're gonna what what terrain to look for or anything like that. Um, it's it's a little bit hard for me to learn. Um, and it's let's see, it's called My Outdoor TV. So I have, I still subscribe to it. It's like ten bucks a month, and it's got like unlimited hunting shows and uh, it's I mean it's it's the the best thing that I've done to be able to keep me you know into it uh, by crossing these two together, like listening to your podcast and you know, people, you know, the guest experience and qualifying that with like another similar scenario, uh, but mm -hmm. being able to physically put, you know, put my mind, you know, to that. So. Dude, that's freaking awesome. You are like literally obsessed and it's cool to see. And I think I've, I've seen what this pans out to be in a few years from a number of people who got into it. Uh, one of my good friends in Bozeman, Sean, he kind of was into sports for most of his life. And then once that was over, it was kind of like, okay, now what? And went into hunting with the same dedication and time asset. And 
is absolutely crushing it. So I can't wait to see like how well you do in the future. And I think it, it boils down. We just did a podcast um, and we were talking about confidence and how important it is. And I, I'll be curious to see how much you start to skyrocket in success as your confidence starts to grow. And it's like, it's tough because in the first couple of years, you don't have that confidence. But once you get over that hump, you get your first kill, then it's all downhill. And it's like, now you have the confidence. You, you know the things that you knew are working. Yeah, absolutely. It just almost qualifies, you know, like you're you're saying, like with sports and stuff, qualifies the physical aspect and mm-hmm. experience you've had with it. So that's yeah. I mean, I can only I can only hope and wish that I'll be able to get <laughs> a, a point like that. But I'll just keep working at it until it happens. So, so what are some of your goals? Like when you look at hunting, I mean, is it a uh, two hundred inch buck or bust, or like what's how do you approach goals? So my first, definitely my first, like two years were. Oh, 100 and 180 or bust or any, you know, just like being over, the, like really over the top. Um, honestly, I really feel that I can get something like that done um, within the next couple of years, but I'm not going to like limit myself um, with, you know, the first for my first kill. I'm not going to be like, oh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, if I don't kill anything within the next 10 years, then I'm just not going to kill anything. Like I'm definitely open to being able to harvest like, you know, a mature animal that's small or a small animal that I'll be able to, you know, kind of put food on the, uh, you know, on my table. Um, but it's, I mean, my goals overall, I just want to be consistent because I see, like I said, like those guys at the bow shop, like they're consistent killers, whether it's a 150 inch four point or it's a, you know, 200 inch, you know, four point it's, they're just consistent. And I know that the consistency for them like makes it fun because you know that they've put in the work. Um, you know that they, you know, have, have had that experience every single year. Um, but they're also, you know, sharing that experience with their kids or their wife or their friends, their best friends. Um, or you look like the, like even just some of the videos of like the born and raised guys, like those guys are best friends. Like those guys will, you know, go to, go to the ends of the earth um, for each other, but they're also consistent, which makes that experience even more special. And I think once, you know, I've, you know, get my hunting partners and stuff and myself to that point, I think it's just going to be special. And I'm, I mean, I would love, obviously anybody would love to kill a 200 inch, you know, mule deer and consistently every year, but I'm, I'm content with killing, you know, with killing something that I worked hard for. Um, I mean, if I had money, I'd probably go to a ranch or something like that. I honestly don't feel like it'd be as special as killing, you know, a 140 inch four, two point or whatever it is, 140 inch four point on, you know, on a day five of a backpack hunt that I've, you know, been working my butt off on, um, you know, and I'm, so I'm willing to put in that work and I just really hope that, you know, at some point that I'll be able to be able to harvest that animal and be able to qualify all the work, the money, the time that I've spent uh, the last few years putting in to learn and, you know, become, you know, a a consistent killer. So did I, it's funny because I do think that the more you struggle in the beginning, the more you appreciate it. And there's something to be said for early success really kind of sinks you in. You want more, but I Mm -hmm. meant to like to my core, I really love seeing how like, and don't take this the wrong way. I love that you haven't been successful yet. Cause I think <laughs> when it happens, you're just going to be like so much, there's going to be so much more appreciation for that moment when you're sitting oh. there at 10,000 feet and you're like, finally it came together. You know what I mean? Like my sister missed a giant bull. Uh, she shot bulls with a rifle, but her <laughs> first archery hunt missed a giant bull at like 18 yards. It just came screaming in her face. I'm like laughing. She's like crying. And I'm like, trust me, like this is just sealed your oh. fate forever because like now it's just, it's on. Now you got to have that experience and it's just going to push you farther. You know? And I, she missed another bull last year, another good bull. And it's like, to the point where it's like devastating for her. But man, when that uh-huh. day comes and she f- swacks a big old six by six, it's going to be so good. It's going to just be amazing. Um, it's yeah. It's literally going to go from bottom of the bottom to top of the top. And there's honestly, there's nothing that I've experienced at least that's going to, you know, replicate, you know, emotions like that. 
No, and that's that's it, man. Like that's that's what this whole hunting thing is about is this journey, like the journey is the roller coaster. And that's what makes it fun. Like if I kill the, I don't know, 300 inch bull every single year on opening day, like I would not be fun anymore. You know, like it's gotta yeah. have the roller oh, yeah. coaster. It's gotta have the highs and lows. Like you gotta put in the work and then get just punched in the face sometimes to really appreciate oh, yeah. the great days. Absolutely. And I, I mean, I've even experienced, you know, a little bit similar to that. Obviously, I mean, I've, I've been at the lows of the lows and I'm still waiting for my high here, but <laughs> it, I've had, I mean, I've drawn back three separate times, one on opening day of my first year on, uh, like now I look back on it and kind of compare it like with numbers and stuff. Well, I, I probably would have said it was a 200 inch deer, my opening day. I, I, oh, if, oh, really? But it's it, he, in reality now that I've you know been able to set eyes on other stuff. He's probably only like 165, 170. Uh, yeah. But at that point, I drawn back 85 yards. I was like, oh, this is money. And my minimum, like I was confident with shooting 85 yards, you know, straight across, no wind. Um, you know, I've been shooting all summer. I've been practicing at 130. Um, you know, consistently like top bottoming out my, you know, my drop away or my, you know, slider sight and everything else. And I was like, Oh my gosh, this is, this is a perfect shot. He's standing there. He had been bumped into me, uh, by some other hunters and he had stopped, uh, 85 yards and saw me start to draw back. And I was like, Oh man, this is perfect. Drew back, anchored in, and then just released when I shot all of a sudden just a rock it was a rock that was under him, but it was behind him quite pretty far. And I had realized that I had actually dr- uh, put my slider sight to 85 instead of 82 and a half. And so that instant like release, I was like, Oh my gosh, like all this practice coming down, like in my mind, this like just that fast. I was like, Oh, this is perfect. Like he's, he's literally going to die right here. And then all of a sudden you hear that chang of an FMJ rocking off a rock. And you're just like, what? <laughs> world like and then he just slowly walks off out and you're just like what in the world happened like everything was set like and then i look at my site and my compare it to my rangefinder, and i accidentally you know m- mixed the two numbers up with five and two and i you know ultimately had the ultimate low at that point um it's it was just you know and then and then even even after that just like drawing on a couple of two points that i you know just completely airball you know missed it was just those lows are the absolute bottom of any of it, any experiences that i've had but talking to people that have had that and had that experience that it's just top of the top and they like they i mean they say that it's you know there's nothing the comparative to it and i just you know i like i said i can't wait one, to have that experience for myself, but two, like some of the people I've talked to, like some of the people that come in and, you know, start archery hunting, you know, have had, have had bad pass or like have, have don't have much else other than that. So we set them up with like, not, I'm not going to say like cheap bows or cheap, you know, equipment, but some of the people I've talked to, like they're, they're doing that because they love to do it and there's not much else for them to do. And I, I, you know, I can't wait to be like a part of an experience of where someone, you know, has that experience of that high, um, you know, gaining that experience that they've had only through what archery can, uh, you know, only give you. So absolutely, man. That's awesome. Do you, have you ever felt like you wanted to quit? Oh, dude, like (laughs) probably five or six times on opening day. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, It's it's, it is, it is absolutely tough. It's, it is in my, I mean, in my opinion, you can, you can fight me on it. You're all right. We'll fight me on it. But I think mule deer hunting is probably the hardest type hunting, uh, in the, I mean, high country mule deer, I feel with an, with a bow is probably the hardest type of hunting to do. And it's, I don't know, maybe it's just because I've killed a couple of two points with a rifle and I was like 14, but me at 25 years old with three years of, you know, new guy experience i feel like i should have something under my belt but it's it's absolutely tough yeah no it it is there's no joke about that uh when you feel like quitting what pushes you through it uh the other just thoughts of the other uh 11 months of the year when i'm like man i wish i was up there like (laughs) like just working you know when i'm at work every day just knowing that like all my time off 
that, you know, I, I've accumulated all the work that I've physically, like work that I physically put in to get to that point, but also work at work that I put in to be able to get to that point. Like it's all for this reason. Like this is, this is literally what I live for is archery hunting. And if I give up or push out early, I will never live it down and I will never, you know, and I'll regret it the rest of my life. And like I said, on my first year, that's exactly what happened when I, you know, pulled out that first day. I actually went home. I didn't even stay and hunt like the low, the lowland or anything. I went home and was like, oh yeah, I guess I'll go up like on the weekend. And as soon as archery hunting was over or as soon as I got home, I was like, man, like right now I could be standing right next to, you know, some animal or, you know, something like that. But the thought of like me not being able to have a bow in my hand and be chasing a mule deer is really what, you know, what pushes me even further. Yeah. No, it's funny. I have a very similar story. I think one, one time ever I just went home early and I'd been rained on for like eight days and literally driving home was just kicking myself. Like, why did I leave? Like, this is dumb. And then especially you get after season and that's when it like sets in. You're like, man, I freaking gave up early. That's I'll never, never live that down with myself. Yeah. And so like, it's, it's carried me through some gnarly hunts, some brutal times. And just, it keeps that in the back of my head that I'm like, man, one day after season, I will be begging for September again. Like this sucks right now. It is not fun, but oh, yeah. it's still better than being, I always say October 1st. Um, but archery season still going in Montana at that time. But you know, like one oh, day okay. after season, it, there's nothing worse than being one day after season. I have to wait 11 months to get it to do it again. So it doesn't matter how hard it is, how bad it sucks. You're like, this is not fun at all. It's 95 degrees outside. It just hiked for five hours and blew the stock or the animal wasn't even freaking there. Like this sucks, but it's still way better than the day after season. Exactly. Oh yeah. And I, I mean, that's almost like a high and low that you got to battle every single time I, you go out there. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, even just preseason scouting, I'm like, man, this sucks. Um, and I, even just like, like the little battles that lead up to the, you know, the war of, you know, what you could say is the archery hunt. So yeah. I, I completely agree. That's awesome. So any other gear, I'm going to ask some gear stuff because you're new to this, you're coming into it. What gear that you've picked up this year, are you excited about or switching over or just in general, absolutely love? Ooh. So, um, I actually switched to a uh, mystery ranch pack, um, from my freaking, I, I, so the one, I, the backpack that I've had the last couple of years is like an actual like backpacking backpack, but I finally made the jump to, uh, or made the investment in getting like a good backpack. And just with all my scouting trips I've had now, and this year I've loaded more weight in with like more cameras and more water and stuff like that, that I'm packing into the, you know, the high country and either setting up cameras or leaving water. But the backpack has probably been the most uh, beneficial thing for me, alongside with the boots um, that I'm uh, that I wear too. Versus my Adidas thirty-five dollar trail running shoe that I bought at like some Payless store. So, <laughs> so that's that was those two are probably my top two. Um, I mean, for comfort wise, because if I'm not comfortable which I think was the big, one of the big issues my first year of pulling out early is I just wasn't comfortable. And if I'm not sleeping well, or I'm not like comfortable with backpacking or like having weight on my back, it just makes it easy to, you know, to make an excuse to come back. Um, so I think my backpack, my mystery ranch backpack and my crispy boots for sure. So if you new hunter, you only get one investment, one big investment per year. What's your first one? Is it going to be glass boots or backpack um i guess i got a lot of glass this year too but i had already had honestly with archery hunting if you can't see i mean or if you can see a deer that's more than a mile away you're probably not going to make it happen that day anyway so i would say cheap out a little bit on the glass and definitely invest in a pack um, a pack or like a, a good sleep system. Um, because if, you know, like I said, if you're not comfortable in the morning, like if you don't get a good night's rest, it makes the entire day and everything else that you're doing, whether it be hiking, um, 
or makes all the other products, I guess you could say that you're using like, you know, pointless because if you're not, if you're not well rested and ready to go, you're not, you know, you're not going to want to push hard. So yeah, probably sleep system, um, would be my number one one sleep system. Uh, huh? That's it. I mean, that's, I mean, a valid concern. Like there's nothing worse than freezing your butt off all night and then just being dog tired the next day. Oh yeah, exactly. Yep. Well, yeah. So tough. yeah, I would, I would definitely say sleep system though. Yeah, you can get, I mean, all are good. Like those are kind of the things that people inherently say buy nice, not twice is like your glass, your boots, your backpack. I guess you could put sleep system in there too, but Mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of hard to get all of them at the same time. And I think you can, I got away with just tennis shoes for a long freaking time, but (laughs) it's like, depends on your feet, your ankles. If you got bad ankles, like don't mess around with it. Get a good pair of boots. That'll cause and it depends if you're truck camping, if you're backpacking in there. I know like I ran an outdoorsman pack for a lot of years and didn't realize how bad it was until I got my stone glacier. And oh. like my outdoorsman empty is seven and a half pounds. Like it's freaking oh. so heavy. And so you're yeah. like constantly packing around 60, 65 pounds, like without an animal on it. Like that was just like yeah. brutal beat you up all day. Mm hmm. Um, yeah that would be that would be tough i thought everly stock was bad at like five pounds but <laughs> holy crap no like legitimately i would grab my bag all the time like what is in here like there's got to be something in a pocket <laughs> somewhere because like it just feels like it's loaded like there's something missing in the bag that there's like a yeah. hidden pocket full of freaking lead yeah where's the freaking lead <laughs> frame that i got attached to this thing yeah no and like now my stone glacier is like wow this thing is like feather compared to my like, other one. Like putting on a t shirt pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> like loaded my bag's probably lighter than my outdoorsman with nothing in it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. With with water and trail cameras all in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Uh so what do you got planned this year? You just your Utah? What's what's the big plan? Uh so so far this year, um I'm gonna try and do a Utah over the counter. Uh, tag with a like a spike only or cow elk um honestly the only reason that i was even thinking about it this year um is we've got on one camera right on the water i thought there was going to be a lot more mule deer activity but there's a lot more uh, elk activity um so meat wise i was like man if i'm you know in case i want to try and hold out on a mule deer um, I might as well fill the, you know, fill the freezer with some cow meat or, you know, a spike or spike, some spike meat or something like that. So I think I'm going to get an over the counter, uh, cow or spike tag, um, where I'm deer hunting, but also I've got my, you know, my normal general season Utah tag. Um, and then I actually fortunately drew a, uh, Ute- or sorry, an Arizona rifle tag as well. Um, and come to find out that, well, the reason we even did the rifle hunt versus the, uh, archery hunt is in Arizona in the unit that we're hunting, they actually let the rifle go first, uh, before the archery hunt. But in order to get, so we wanted to make it like with our experience that we had in there and, you know, seeing the big bucks that we had seen in the desert, um, I was like, man, we better, let's just put in for the rifle because we know we'll draw it because it's a pretty low point area. Mm-hmm. for uh for a rifle hunt but we're going to take our bows instead um and we're going to try and get it done with a bow um and we'll see we'll see what happens the you know first few days whether we whether we you know cry baby out and just pull the gun out or <laughs> if we get it done with the with the you know with the right or the bows so you gotta go full commit and not even take a gun man if you I take know. a gun, you'll just you'll give up too soon. I'm going. I know it's it's like a ten or it's like a twelve hour drive, and I'm just like, oh man, if I leave my gun and I cut and that last day, I come to find out that there's a there's a big old bucket only two hundred yards. I'm gonna be <laughs> I'm gonna be so mad if I don't you know make it happen. But yeah, but think but, how much so, harder you'll work if you have to get it down with a bow. Yeah, so I am I'm leaving my gun at camp for the first four days. And if I don't get it done within the first four days and I've had good chances that I'm still going to use the bow. But if not, if I, if I just can't make it happen for whatever reason, which I'm, I'm about 90% positive we'll be able to make it happen with 
with just our experience last year of them, how active they are during the rifle hunt and how not skittish they are during the rifle hunt or the first few days, I will, I do think we'll be able to get it done. Um, but with the potential that we've seen, uh, and know is in the area, uh, it's, it's going to be hard to leave the gun in the truck or <laughs> if, 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 uh, if it doesn't happen within the first four days. So, yeah, no. And that's the thing is like, you'd be, it's hard to shoot a 160 buck with your bow if you're seeing 180s that you could shoot with your rifle. It's going to be like, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> the, the temptation's always there. So what I'll do is I'll probably just have my buddy put the uh, trigger lock on there hide the <laughs> for the first four days just so I make sure that I really don't do it. It's probably what I'll do. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. Well, awesome. Well, thanks, Tyler. Best of luck this year, man. Excited to see how you do. I'll be following along, and uh, you can't wait to see. I hope opening day, smack a big buck. That would be pretty sweet. It'd probably take a lot of pressure off you. You know, you, oh. like you go unsuccessful three years, and then this year you'll kill like two bucks and a bull. So that would be really cool. I'd be pumped for that for sure, <laughs> man. I, I appreciate the opportunity to be on as well. And um, like I said, I work at uh, Black Ovis, and if anybody needs any – any information or want to talk about any type of gear, feel free to give us a call and, um, you know, ask for me specifically if you'd like. So awesome. always, op- always open to anything, man. If, if you need anything too, let us know. For sure. Hey, Tyler, what's your Instagram? Uh, it's Tyler underscore the underscore muley underscore reaper. I per- believe, <laughs> I th- even though I've never killed anything. So <laughs> it'll That's come right. straight this year. It's gonna. It's all gonna come to fruition, man. Well, we'll, we'll link to it. We'll put it up there. Everybody, go follow Ty. He's a good kid. And uh, thanks, Tyler, for supporting the podcast for so long and just being a part of the journey. So it's pretty cool to see. Glad to have you on. And uh, best of luck this year, man. Thanks, Cody. Appreciate it, man. Good luck to you this year. Today's episode brought to you by Onyx Maps. Onyx is a must-have tool for all of you serious hunters. With season just around the corner, I am constantly using my Onyx to e-scout and learn everything I can about my upcoming hunts. Onyx Maps works across all of my devices so I can scout areas, mark locations on my desktop, and then automatically they appear on my phone when I'm in the field using my smartphone as a GPS. Onyx even works on your phone if you don't have service or it's in airplane mode. I just save all the maps that I am going to need and before I head into the the backcountry or go out of service and my Onyx app will show me right where I am and show me all of my waypoints from e-scouting and all of my marked locations. Onyx is available in all 50 states, and I can't speak highly enough about this system. It is truly a must-have for me, and I think anyone hunting out west. Even if you're not worried about the public-private, you're hunting deep in the wilderness, it's still an awesome tool, but if you're anywhere near private land, it is a must-have. Use the promo code TRO, and you'll get 20% off your membership Go download it today and get familiar with the app before your hunt. Don't download it on your way to your hunt. Get familiar with this because there's so many cool tools that you can learn from it. Go to onxmaps.com. Check it out. Today's podcast brought to you by Solo Targets. Solo targets are life-size, ultra-realistic 2D targets, and I have been obsessed with the solo targets and love the realism of having to pick a spot on an animal and not just shoot a dot on a block. The solo targets you can turn with the solo targets you can turn any block into a ultra realistic hunting scenario for much much cheaper than a 3D target and preferably I think I prefer them over shooting a 3D target. I also really like that all the targets are actually life size, which really gives you a feel for what an animal is going to look like in your sights at different yardages. I just got the new mule deer buck target and the thing is badass. The target alone will give you buck fever. It's a giant buck. We set it up in the field and with just a small block target behind it, which is so it adds that realistic pressure of having to hit the vitals because if you hit anywhere else, you're not going to hit the block that's behind it. Uh, it is so fun. Just that added little bit of pressure makes you really hone in on that target and it adds to that little buck fever scenario, puts the pressure on, so to speak. Head over to solotargets.com, check them out. 
awesome. They got elk targets, they got antelope targets, mule deer targets, all kinds of cool stuff, sheep, bear, all kinds of great targets. Use the Rich Outdoors promo code TRO and you'll get 20% off your new badass target system. Thanks for tuning in to the podcast and to Muley Monday. If you like this episode and you learned something along the way, be sure to share the podcast with a hunting buddy. And if you get a chance, leave us a review on iTunes, on Stitcher, wherever you listen to the podcast. Appreciate it. Thank you so much.